Hello and welcome to everybody here. Thank you for joining us. And it's my pleasure to, uh, to introduce our next hour long session with you uh, today. My name is Robbie Nock and I'm the Director of Entrepreneurship and Professional Practice at Art Center College of Design. I would imagine that many of you are familiar with Art Center, um, but for those that are not, we are a 90 year old private art and design college in Pasadena. And we offer all of the visual arts as well as the most of the design uh, practices and methodologies from industrial design, graphic design, interaction design, transportation design, uh, entertainment, and uh, across the board. So um, part of the, the opportunity today is to share with you a little bit about the background of our entrepreneurship programs and how we are supporting uh, a remarkable community of inventors, innovators, and creative visionaries. Uh, and Charlie is uh, our, our prime example. So um, it's a pleasure to be able to, to share this with you. And, and part of what we do at Art Center is we help build a, pro a professional pathway to realize your creative vision. And oftentimes that creative vision requires a lot more than just the creative side of what you do. Uh, the visual communication, the product, the service, the business model, the marketing plan, the team and the engineering that might go into any type of idea is really essential for uh, paving your path towards launch. And uh, Charlie is a, a, a remarkable alum and uh, has a background in, in performance and dance uh, and came to Art Center with a vision for his next stage of his career and really learn to bring together a, a, a wide range of elements that Art, Art Center offers uh, to build his business and um, eventually launch uh, at his company after graduation. So um, before, we, before I let Charlie share a little bit more about what he's actually working on, we really need to thank a few, a few key faculty and departments at Art Center. Um, Hydrin Mumperdrum, Jonathan Abarbanel, uh, Christina Costella, um, Ginny Kiesling, uh, and, and, uh, Anya Hoffman, Karen Hoffman, and a whole community of faculty, administrators, and um, Art Center partners have supported Charlie in, in launching this company, uh, including our, our incredible social impact office, Design Matters, and as well as partners outside of the college, including Mattel and the Clean Tech Incubator. Uh, at, at Lacey in, in downtown LA. So uh, with that, I will, I will leave it with Charlie uh, to share exactly what it is that he's doing. And then we will go deeper into Q&A after the fact. Thank you and welcome Charlie. Hey everybody. So as Robbie said, I'm Charlie and you can call me that. Um, I'm here to talk about the building of Archimelia, which is the house of a thousand stories. Uh, but first, uh, I want to kind of reiterate that if there are any questions, just add them into the chat at any time as they come to you so that we have things to talk about at the end. It's always the juicy part uh, to dialogue with people and um, hopefully it won't be too long winded. Uh, I created this toy house because I believe that play is how we learn this stuff that's hard to teach. And since children are the stewards of tomorrow, we want to give them the tools necessary to get there or to protect it. And I think that through imagination, we learn to believe in something impossible. And then through play, we get to exercise making that impossible become real. Um, when asked to describe the toy house, I think of it as like, what would happen if you took an origami transformer and collided it with a, like a dollhouse style Where's Waldo into a, a tinker toy encyclopedia. Um, it's kind of, it's a mix of all of these, these elements. And that's what, the Archimelia is all about. Um, this is a four pound toy house. So oh, angle it down. Here it is, it's a four pound toy house. And if you flip, tip and play, it comes with five little interior play sets that are all set up. Um, each of these unfold into imaginative uh, play, play spaces designed to um, offer open-ended make-believe. Uh, this one here is um, it's all about nutritious play teaching kids about fine motor skills and memory, sequential learning, mechanics, engineering, and the list. <clears throat> it's also about open-ended make-believe um, or perspective shifting. 
So this one is an airplane and it takes off as a military aircraft. But then when it lands, it becomes like a commercial airliner. So the point is kind of teaching kids that different points of view from the same thing provide new outcomes. Um, my face is missing, doesn't matter. <clears throat> Look at this, not me. The, um, it's designed to fit with all toys. So anything from your little ones to your big ones are intended to be played in here. So instead of buying new toys, just go get the ones you already have and bring them to bear um, or bring them to play rather. Uh, when unfolded, all five of these play sets take up about 10 times the size. So they match the equivalent of the largest dollhouses on the market. But then you can collapse it because 40% of new parents live in 500 square feet or less. It all collapses into what becomes like a six by 10 inch little box that is meant to sit on your bookshelf. Um, I like to think of this as the Pixar of toys. So it's designed for kids, but it's with parents in mind. Um, and so while it's meant for six to 10 year olds, there's really something in here for the kid and all of us. And I think if the nutritious play value weren't enough, I'm proud to share that the house is made without any plastic or metal. So it's made from trees grown in responsibly managed forests that use materials that are FSC certified and non-toxic. It's sourced all within the United States um, the manufacturing, the assembly, the design, the hand assembly, and the design are all here in Los Angeles. <clears throat> and just recently I launched a limited edition run. So there are about 150 of these remaining um, that comes with four rooms as well as a companion chapter book. And um, the book was inspired by the play sets and uh, they should all be ready for shipping in early November. Thank you, Charlie. That is amazing. So I, I think one of the, the, the main um, takeaways here is that you're really integrating three very, very unique business strategies into your product and, and the plans for Archimelia. There's a, a, an entire philosophy on inclusive learning and play. There's a, a manufacturing process that is local, responsible, and totally focused on uh, materials that, that are um, healthy for the world. And then there's a, a business model and a strategy that really you're building uh, from the ground up. And I, I think all of those things come together through Art Center and through your path as a creative entrepreneur. And I guess to, to begin with, I, I'd really like for you to share with us how this toy idea came together. Where did it start? What was the original inspiration? And then how did you move through the various stages of early development at Art Center? Um, I think to understand the house, it's important to know a little bit of my own backstory. So I'll mention that I was a dancer for about 20 years. Um, <clears throat> Uh, it's like I started in competition dance, like the kind you see, the dramatic kind you see on reality television. Um, it went into ballet, I danced in a ballet company and that par parlayed into a modern and contemporary career with a woman named Twyla Tharp in New York. And uh, I worked as her assistant, I notated her choreography and staged, um, staged the work around the country, around the world. And even though like in my dance career, at one point I won the, I was the best male dancer in Europe. At another point, I was the best male dancer on Broadway. So I had this prolific career, but um, it, the, the environment of my relationship with dance was incredibly toxic. And a lot of that was uh, because of like intense public body shaming and a deep self-loathe. Um, while virtuosic, I was always considered too short, too fat, and too bald. And I described the experience as being like uh, radioactive, that the longer I stayed in it, the sicker I became. So I had two options to either quit or to stay and get sick. Um, but for me, dance was this like full body experience. At the end of a performance, every muscle fiber is vibrating. So you feel your entire body. You hear the applause and you hear the ringing of the music. You taste the sweat. Uh, the salty of the sweat, you can smell like the, the mustiness of your costume and you're looking out at the bright lights in an audience. It's at one time incredibly intimate and then at another time shared with the public. And this experience was just so phenomenal. I was like, I, I want that. So I had to find a third option and that third option kind of dealt with perseverance and perspective that it wasn't so much that I, I couldn't change who I was but I could change what I allowed or how I saw myself. And in so doing, I would give myself permission to pursue my potential. Um, I think the sad part of the story is that I didn't realize this until much later. And so there is a part of me as like a um, public service. I feel like it's my responsibility to help provide younger generations with this knowledge of 
you have like persistence and perseverance are far more critical to an outcome of success than anything else, as far as I'm concerned. Um, and it was right around that same time that I found this fascinating study. It turns out they gave six year olds this riddle that said, if you, there's a ship captain in a boat and there are 10 sheep and five goats, how old is the ship captain? And naturally all the six year olds were like, okay, well they carry the one, it was 36. And they all agreed that the ship captain was 36 years old. Then they gave the same riddle to eight year olds, you know, ship captain, boat, 10 sheep, five goats, how old is the ship captain? And the eight-year-olds were like, this is impossible to answer. And so it suggests that there's something that happens between six and eight, where we realize that, as I like to say it, we realize that our capes are just costumes. And so in my mind, had I been able to hold on to a sense of creativity and imagination to believe that it was possible to be both weird and popular, maybe I wouldn't have been so troubled by so much of what my career was. And so could we get in there and that really, that, that special little time, six to eight year olds, and provide them an opportunity to recognize that creativity and imagination are so critical to just well-being and health, um, to healthy development. Uh, and that's kind of like the genesis of this. Now, this is not at all how I started the project, but I believe that that question was at the back of my mind. It was something I was wrestling with and it was only a matter of time before it found its way out. Um, and I know that this is a very philosophical approach to toy design, but I feel like it kind of like had to start somewhere, you know? Right, and, and <clears throat> as you were thinking about those factors and influences and forces that were going into your career transition it, from, from dance performer to product designer, how did you begin to explore the, the concept around a, a toy house? Where did that come from? And what was the role of Mattel in helping you start to think about this particular area to, to really uh, dive deeply into. Yeah. Um, the project started as a, like a, in, it was at Art Center, obviously. Um, I mean, I don't know if that's obvious. Anyway, it started at Art Center in a class that was sponsored by Mattel and in collaboration with Design Matters. Design Matters is the minor program at Art Center that focuses on social impact and environmental sustainability. And the question was to redesign the Barbie dream house. In another class I was taking the brief or the, the challenge at the beginning of the term was to design for 2035. And as we've seen outside, the world is already falling apart. So the idea of spending any sort of energy designing for 2035 was really confusing for me. All I thought about was like, we need, we need solutions today because today is like, we need to do something now. We can't, we won't have a 2035 to get to. And so my proposal was, what if I tried to design a toy for kids today that become the movers and shakers of 2035? Uh, can we help them understand a new way of looking at the world or prepare them for whatever that is? Um, and so they said, yes, Art Center was like, yeah, you can do that, which is usually not allowed because uh, crossing classes, different teachers ask for different things and it becomes a conflict. Um, it was an incredibly robust development though. I had five teachers instead of two or three. And the, usually one class is about 20 hours a week. And so I had time now in my schedule and my credits to do about 40 hours. So there's a lot of time for developing research, prototyping, play testing, interviews, like all of it. It was uh, pretty awesome. Um, at the same time, I think I definitely believe in inclusive design. And so that's this notion of like reaching out to the perimeter. If you can catch the people on the edge of something, then you're gonna definitely catch everybody else. And so how do I reach a broader audience? And so I thought about this question, what makes a house to a kid without a home? And that led me to foster kids, the foster care community, um, a relocated Syrian refugee family, and then dialogues with a military vet who uh, was kind of grew, grew up in an environment of always moving from military base to military base. Um, through all my play testing with these communities, I learned that a house is more than four walls and a roof. It's more than drywall and sheetrock. It's actually made up out of what, like safety and love. If you feel safe, if you feel loved, then you have the foundation you need for confidence and creativity, for courage and critical thinking, the four like juicy C's. Um, so I think that kind of led to this notion here in this house in redesigning it, it was saying, you know, for a foster kid, home is where you have a sock from your dad or a photograph of a grandparent. And so one of the rooms in this limited edition launch is just a drawer to hold all of your treasures. From the refugee community, I learned that home is where the smell of mom's cooking is. And so one of the rooms unfolds into a kitchen. It's more of a communal space. 
the military vet was talking about planes, like the act of traveling was more of a home. And so one of them, as you saw, unfolds into an airplane. And then through all of that research, I learned for myself that one of the homes for me has been a theater or a dance studio, that I have more comfort and confidence in that space than anywhere else I could imagine. And so the fourth room unfolds into a theater. Um, I think instead of prescribing unrealistic futures of mega mansions with pony dens and elevators and swimming pools, I, I was hoping to be able to glorify the spaces that we actually call home. Um, I know that was kind of a long answer. Uh, and I also want to point out that in the, this notion of kind of inclusive design or being broad, I intentionally think of it as a toy house and not a dollhouse, because as a toy house, um, you, I think dollhouses are immediately gendered. A dollhouse is for dolls. And unfortunately, our society says that girls play with dolls. And so I wanted to kind of break that gender divide. And so I call it a toy house. That might be a little bit of an issue. Maybe that's part of why people get confused because they think the house is just the toy. And usually when it's a dollhouse, you know that it's a servant to the character. Um, but it is a toy house because I think that um, that invites a broader audience to be comfortable meeting it initially in order to come inside and start to get creative. That component to the design and the philosophy and the mission continues to run through your process after Art Center. And in parallel to that, and I think another core foundational uh, kind of value that you brought to bear in, in the design is the materials and manufacturing process. Mm -hmm. Can you talk a little bit about how you, you started to explore life cycle analysis and the, the realities of actually making a physical product and, and then how that has informed the choices that you've made in, uh, you know, in the goal of inclusive play and in the goal of a, a price point that is um, more achievable than what is currently on the market. Right. Um, well, as I was, yeah, it's all paper based as fabrication goes. So there's this really phenomenal design tool. Um, it's called the life cycle analysis. It was introduced to me by Hydrin Mumber Drum and Jonathan and Barbanel. And it's essentially like reverse engineering any product. Um, and you do it to figure out what the product was made of, but it's not just what it's made of, but what is required to make the things that are used to make the thing that you're doing. So it's not just saying, yes, there's a battery, but how do you make the battery? What are all of the materials and the processes that go into making the battery that goes into whatever the toy is? So it's an incredibly comprehensive survey. So I bought the original Barbie dream house and dissected it. So you can separate it by plastics. If you burn plastics, you can tell by the smell or the color of the flame or the temperature, what kind of plastic it is. And then reverse engineering how those plastics come in, into being um, gives you this list. Um, from my research, I proposed that there were seven gases, five plastics, eight metals, four minerals, two elements, and three types of paper that go into making a 27 pound toy from two different continents that is designed to end in a landfill. And so from a sustainability point of view, there's a lot of low hanging fruit to be able to get in there and address issues. Um, the first one was because 26 pounds of that 27 pound door are plastic, why not just decide, like confirm it will not be made with plastic. And so that was my early stance. I need to find a different way to make a toy house that does not require plastic or metal. Because a lot of those things require oil drilling, land degradation, it's biodiversity depletion, it toxins for the air, the water, the soil, it's just, it's a mess. So no plastics, it's all paper-based. Um, and I think it's kind of cool because to me, if paper were a dancer, it would be the kind of dancer who can do every style and every technique. It's an incredibly versatile material. Um, the second kind of opportunity for big disruption would be to just decrease the size. Like dollhouses are often over 20 pounds and they're three feet tall. They're so big that they can't, they're not portable. So that limits the kind of shared play. You could only have kids come over to play with it or share with it especially now with COVID, that's harder to do. It has to be assembled by parents. I mean, you don't really see dollhouses being the toy of choice for kids when they're going to a park or a restaurant with a family. Um, so if I could decrease the size without losing the value of the volume, that would be, uh, I think, beneficial all around. And so it is much smaller, but it expands since that was where paper comes into play. Um, also by being smaller, you reduce weight for shipping. 
um, and there's less room required for storage. So just the CO2 offsets from that alone. Uh, and then trying to think about the distribution, like a supply chain. Um, the supply chain is all of the steps that something needs to go through to get from where it doesn't exist to where it's like headphones on your head. And if you can minimize the steps in the supply chain, that's just further reductions in cost and environmental impact. So all of this, there's just three steps. It started on the East Coast in some forests, came over to Burbank for some printing, it's down in Santa Ana for some cutting, and then it comes to Inglewood for assembly. So I think that kind of simplified step process is another kind of opportunity for environmental impact. Um, I did speak to 37 engineers throughout the course of this. It took about 14 months and they all kept saying, this will never happen. Uh, it's too complicated or uh, it's not, it needs to be done out of plastic. It needs to be made overseas. Um, just a lot of complications. And it took, uh, yeah, 14 months to kind of balance, to crack the code between environment and budget and purpose location material. Um, but we did it, um, we think <laughs> we did it. And uh, it's, you know, the lessons from my life in dance are that uh, it's all about, you know, changing your perspective and dogged perseverance. Um, yeah, for the record, while it is made with recycled materials, it is not in itself yet recyclable. And that's because there's a co-mingled material. Here's a little education. The paper has been coated with latex, which is itself a natural or sustainable source. Um, and that gives it both durability and then also uh, you can clean the surface. So if there's any spot cleaning or whatnot. Um, in the future, I hope to be able to find uh, a type of coating substrate for the paper that would allow a parent to, when they're done with it, just put it in the paper recycling bin and like wash their hands and move on. So that's kind of the future where we're headed. Uh, in the meantime, this is where we're at. And, and I think those sort of originating philosophies and forces, the, the inclusive play, sustainable manufacturing, and you as the artist designer founder are, are what make Archimelia totally unique. And that comes from this incredible community of faculty, mentors, partners at Art Center. We, you know, we are able to provide this platform for you to start thinking about your role as a founder for your, you know, your transition from graduation into that rapid timeline of building and, and pivoting and iterating the product so that you can actually uh, make it and, and bring it into people's homes. What has been some of the, the challenges in that transition and how have you uh, really continued to persevere building this business as a, a creative entrepreneur? Mm -hmm. um, I think, you know, you can't, you can't really talk about, uh, it's like, so Art Center is a top 10 design school in the world. So it's incredibly competitive and it's incredibly rigorous that you end up doing easily 40 hours a week of work. And after I did all of my terms back to back, so it was nine terms in a row, including the summer. By the end, when I graduated, it was just sheer exhaustion. I was a really good student. I was very, very good at being a student, but students do not run companies. Students do not motivate or activate. They're really good at following directions. And I think where Launch Lab became so valuable, Launch Lab was the, for anybody out there, Launch Lab is a, a program. It's like a, an honors program after you graduate where you're given a small amount of money and unlimited access to any faculty to be able to produce an outcome, to take an idea to the next step. And I think at the time I graduated, I was ready to just like, I need a month off, I need to relax or like some time down, some downtime. <laughs> I guess it's the same. Anyway, I need to like relax. I think had I relaxed when I look back on it, um, I've learned from performing that sometimes when stamina is an issue, when you exit the stage, it's often harder to come back on the stage. If you just stay on the stage, you forced to, you're forced to stay engaged and it becomes easier to get back into something that you know is gonna cause a lot of pain. And I think in that same respect, Launch Lab was, like it came at this critical time with you and Christina Castella, Jonathan of Barbanel and Jenny Kiesling to be able to kind of recognize what this gap was. How do I become, how do I transition from a student to a professional? To not ask for permission, to, but to realize that I'm in control or in charge of it, or I'm responsible for it. Um, and I think a lesson I continue to learn is there's so many moments like with manufacturing after the 30th person to say, it's not gonna happen, you can't do this. 
that would go home and be like, all right, well, I gave it a good shot and then walk away because there wasn't a teacher who was standing by to say, oh, here's the answer and then to move forward. Um, and then I would sit there and realize that if I wanted this thing to exist, which I believe in my heart should, nobody else, like it's all, it's all on my laptop. Nobody else has my laptop to take those files and to do something with the idea. The only way that this idea will happen is if I figure it out. And so stop waiting for permission, stop waiting for somebody else to do it, just get up and go do the work. Um, so I think that's kind of the biggest difference between, or what I've been understanding as a challenge to get away from school and transitioning into, and it was also where Art Center was so pivotal. Um, currently, another kind of obstacle is this phrase from some people who view this and they say, I love it and it's beautiful, I don't get it. <laughs> and it's, it's kind of trying to understand, okay, how do I, what's missing in the communication of this? What am I seeing that I haven't um, expressed yet? And again, a dance parallel, you wanna be able to perform something, but if you're only connecting with one person in an audience of a thousand, it's not a very effective communication strategy. And I think the, you know, to me, it's, it's quite simple. It's just, it's a playset. And with any other playset, you bring your dolls, your toys, your Hot Wheels or whatever they are. I don't know if I'm allowed to say that. You bring your other toys, like small rolling cars, and you bring them into your playset and you start playing. Um, what I've learned is that like with kids, if you give them a cow and a sheep, they're gonna make some animal noises. But if you then give them a rocket ship, they're gonna say like to the moon and back. It's a stupid joke, but the point is the same, that it's, it's about context more than it is the character. And I think for me as a dancer, you know, you could put me in a costume, but until you're on stage in the set, that's when everything comes to life. So go get your figurines that you have and use this as a platform to begin telling your stories and make believe. Um, and then I think beyond it, it provides hours of like screen free engagement led by the child's interests. There's an online platform called the Tutorium that is being built out that is um, an additional series of hundreds of exercise, exercises to dancer, games and activities that kids could be prompted to do. Um, and then I think the other thing about it that's different is that it's not a singular toy. So it goes through kind of all of the stages of play. The first one would be construction, kind of like Legos or building sets. So it's setting it up. The second type of play is more of your traditional dollhouse or make-believe play, which I would call like expression. So it's just telling stories or acting things out, role play. The third one, when that kind of gets boring, you have this investigation where kids are brought into these illustrations um, and the idiomatic phrases that are hidden therein. After that, it becomes education through the tutorium, through other things like who is or what is happening. Uh, and then after that is like a creation. So it's more of a DIY craft kit where you can build out your own props and accessories to tell additional stories beyond what is provided. And then organization at the end where it's like, how do you put all of this back away to fit it and to store it? Uh, so it kind of runs the gamut of, of play experiences. Um, and I don't think a lot of toys prioritize the full range. It's usually just let's target one. Um, and I am speaking about the illustrations, but I haven't mentioned for anybody <clears throat> who doesn't know, like very simply here on the top is a house of cards. So already there's this idiomatic phrase, what is a house of cards? And could kids learn what that phrase means? Inside this deck of cards, there's one card missing. For kids to figure out what card is missing, they would need to learn what a deck of, like the structure of a deck of cards. From that they deduce by eliminating all of them or crossing them off their list. Two cards are not visible. One of them is hidden under this little mouse who's going for the cheese. And then the other card is missing. So at the end, you have these two cards and you have to use process of elimination to figure out which card is being obscured by the mouse. So there's a game inside of this illustration. So initially they're shingles, but there's now something else further inside or there are codes to crack. It's very much like Highlights Magazine as far as interaction goes. Um, and that's kind of what I'm speaking about with the investigation and then later the education. Maybe this leads a kid to buying a deck of cards or a parent pulling one out from a closet and suddenly there's a, a new activity that the family could do, which actually isn't related to the house, but it's just game night with cards. Um, and I think that's a, it's a positive thing to, to encourage. Well, and, and that concept of creating your own reality through these prompts and through these flexible structures, I think is a, a, a major shift in the approach towards uh, imagining the future for young people. I think 
uh, especially knowing what it, when I grew up, what it was like, there was a, a lot of prescribed metaphors for what the world should look like, whether it was the Ninja Turtles or anything else. This actually shifts the perspective entirely and gives the, the, the player, the, the child, the, and the, um, the toy a new way of really opening up the possibilities for how things are and what they can be. And in a world where there are so many challenges and conflicts and problems to do with legacies of, of years of political structures and um, you know, bad ways of doing things, this approach really brings out a totally new philosophy. And I think what I, what I would love to learn next from you is how do you imagine this first toy, the, the house, setting up a trajectory of this type of um, an ongoing product series or company that's going to produce not just a toy and not just you know one set, but a book and a game and you know many iterations of this conceptual approach. I think there's a, like 89 answers in my head right now. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know, I don't have enough fingers. Um, initially, I love when you were talking about kind of um, expanding, there is a conversation about this passage, this dialogue that you were just bringing up. And I think of like the fact that I was a dancer, part of what I think, the notion of my performing experience and how it comes to play or how it comes out or is manifested in this, you think of the traditional audience performer relationship and it's a one-way road where the audience is having to project their feelings inside of the actors on the stage. It's always, it's always very exciting when the actors break what we call the fourth wall in theater and come out and meet us, right? And so in that respect, I feel like with make-believe or play, instead of miniaturizing ourselves to get inside of the toy house, throughout the illustrations are like two scale objects that um, kind of invite the toy to maximize itself to meet us. So on the back of the theater is this life-size uh, marker for like autographs. And so if I were to set that up and play with it, it's not then ar arbitrary to have some sort of other artifact, a phone or a mug or like chapstick to come to the party to play inside of this. So I start mixing what is real and what is fake. And I think as a dancer, we live in this, we straddle reality and make-believe. It's like, I have to make believe that I'm light as air, even though I'm moving on earth with gravity. I have to make believe that it's effortless when it's really quite effortful. I have to make believe that I enjoy this when like every joint in my body is in pain. So we're constantly straddling pretend and real. Um, and I think that's a really cool thing. And that's what make believe is in storytelling. It's not, I think it makes us uniquely qualified um, and intuitive as dancers when it comes to creating some sort of a toy or make believe. So I think, uh, and then lastly, in like the illustrations of all of this, the, um, there's a combination of like computer work. So it's really perfect, absolutely unattainable to a kid as far as illustrations go. But then it's populated with assets, again, like here in the theater, like um, brick walls that are real brick, uh, real wood samples. There's a sense of reality in it. And then here on the back is a stage door that's an actual stage door or this is a little strawberry basket that's substituting as a dumpster. So there are natural world artifacts that are present in the illustrations. Um, and then on top of it, there are hand-drawn illustrations. So all of this is again, breaking the fourth wall and that kids can scribble to become part of it. Uh, it's not so far-fetched to have them draw something, cut it out and tape it to the walls. And then the photographs become real life. Like I've seen this outside and it's here in my toy. And I think that cross or that blend is kind of what I would see as this kind of expandable opportunity in my mind. If a kid were to set this up on like the theater up on a rock in their backyard, they could pretend it's a lunar landscape, just like they could set it up under the sink in their kitchen and pretend like it's a sewer uh, theater performance like Guys and Dolls or the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, whatever. Um, so I think that this notion of kind of expandable opportunities for play is teaching kids, you know, we talk about I'm so long-winded. These are all the ideas, they're coming out. We no, talk it's about, very good. We talk about augmented reality, virtual reality. Um, there's a third one. Mixed reality. Sure. Um, all these different realities. It's as if reality is no longer good enough. Like reality isn't magical enough. And I think what I've learned through all of this is that it isn't, it isn't um, technology or like 
the thing that turns, how do you say this? The thing that turns uh, reality on is your imagination. It doesn't need to come from technology providing it. It comes from how I see the world or what I'm bringing to the table. Um, that to me is like critical. So then bigger picture, I guess, if you were asking like how this goes in the future is like beyond just these four rooms, uh, my hope is for this to look a lot like, you know, a blockbuster movie, rent a rental store is that instead of there being like comedy and drama and action, it's like career and travel and animals. And kids could go through just like in Build-A-Bear uh, and create their dream house one room at a time and select anything from like a Turkish market to a hippopotamus hovel. And here's like Frida Kahlo's art studio. And here is the inside of a human brain. And I'm gonna run along a neural synapse. Like, what is that? How do we, we can like the, the options for what is familiar or what is exciting, I think become quite open-ended. And I would love, I just, I would love that experience for kids to start to realize that what's possible is greater than what's immediate in a sense. That is transformational. And the kid in me really gets it. You know, I can imagine wanting this toy, but they, oftentimes the six-year-old doesn't have the full purchase power. So, what is what are some of the questions that parents are asking and what are some of the ways in which the the you know your strategy is really meeting their expectations as well yeah, i think from research focus groups and play testing parents want um like educational toys that are that can capture attention but also toys that are adaptable they want toys that teach kindness um and critical thinking so those are types of priorities is like learning how to take better care of our toys instead of thinking that they can just be tossed around is a good thing. It's kindness, it's empathy, um, expression and self-awareness. But I think also, um, especially with the Black Lives Matter movement and the social uh, you know, upheaval that's happening, um, diversity, equity, inclusion have been really important to me as like integrating it, not just into a company profile, but into the product itself. Um, where that stands out is that there are like cultural references in the illustrations that span the globe. So in the kitchen, there might be an enlarged spoon and fork that in Filipino culture is a sign of wealth and prosperity. Uh, but to anybody else, it may not mean anything. It's just a spoon and a fork on a kitchen. But in having that in there, someone who is of Filipino descent is gonna see that and feel like their personal cultural identity is being reflected back to them. And then for people who don't know about it, we'll get to through the tutorium, learn about other points of view. In the same way with race, you know, there are nods to Martin Luther King Jr. So you have your iconic figures and they're always very important. But what if, or how do we draw attention to the less known, but equally as important figures? Um, so like on the airplane, there's a little patch for the Tuskegee Airmen. And a prompt would be for kids to figure out first, identify the patch. And then from that, learn a little bit more about who these people were and their valuable contribution to who we are today. Um, and then with inclusion, it's this notion that, you know, go grab all of your dolls because they all belong here. It's not just for one type. This is for all of them. They all they all have a, an asset to provide toward the player, the outcome. Um, and then with ableism, you know, I've tried to set all of these up with my eyes closed uh, just to feel the structure and how the mechanics work. Um, and for the most part, you could also do all of them with a single hand. It takes a little bit of, of you know, dexterity, but it's, it's possible. And I... I've thought of this from the point of view of any type of kid being able to have some sort of entry point to it. There's a book, so kids who prefer to read first to then enhance their play could do that. Kids who prefer play first might then find the book and get into reading. And then beyond that, as a price point goes, right now it's all one. In order to be able to manufacture this and get this going, I had to set everything up as a chunk. So I had to make 300, 400 units all at once, it's fixed. But in the future, what I hope to be able to do is sell the rooms individually. So the price point has dropped down exponentially. So lower income families do have access to build their dream house kind of one room at a time instead of having to take out like on a layaway plan or through credit card debt, buying a massive thing all at once. Um, I mean, yeah, those are the, the efforts I'm trying to put in place to build something that is accessible, uh, all things considered. Right, and, and parents really understand the need for that type of engagement to go from play to puzzle to reading to collaboration and 
communication with other children as you experiment and explore, that is transformational. And I think that shift is a shift that we're going to see in other industries and other products. And, and you're, that you're leading this through such a, um, a dedicated uh, approach to, to children and, and to their development, I think is an incredible example of what the type of entrepreneurial venture that Art Center is fostering. And uh, we're seeing more and more of this type of approach and the intersections of the different methodologies, photography, film, illustration, product design, game design, all of that is coming out in what you're doing. And you, you studied product design. So how did you kind of absorb all of these approaches and, and uh, strategies to, to include in the product uh, as you were learning about the design approach? I didn't, I didn't know about any of these tools before Art Center. I had a sense of what things were, how to make something. I'd watched people like Twyla Tharp, who are legendary in their own right, build an entire Broadway musical. So I'd, I'd been able to witness the process of creating something from nothing to a thing. Some of them were successful, some of them less so, but I'd never in my own right been able to apply the skills to do that until I came to Art Center. I think that was the remarkable thing as Art Center taught, um, it taught me how to translate those skill sets. Like it showed me that um, it, it taught me how practice could become prototyping or that rehearsal was like research or that performing was like a presentation that um, a performance was a product. I started to understand all these parallels, which made it incredibly rich as an experience. And then there were classes for licensing, for uh, business pitching, uh, pit pitching a business, a uh, pitch deck for marketing strategies, brand strategies. I mean, the list of all of the classes that Art Center provided really created this holistic, I think of it as like a hub with the spokes shooting out in every direction. And it set up a structure that allowed me the confidence to move forward with this where, you know, I never, I don't feel like I quit dancing. I feel like I just changed my shoes. And that for the first time I feel confident to say something that I think matters, to put something into the world that I think is important. Um, but it isn't a dance, or you could think of this as my dance. This is my this is my movie or my, you know, whatever that outcome is. This is my way of saying this is something that I think would make the world a little bit better. Um, and Art Center was absolutely pivotal in kind of helping trigger that transition. Well, we we want to do that for more students in the future. So your your assessment and, and, and kind of breakdown of how that worked for you is, is super valuable to hear. And I think something that oftentimes people don't realize is really going on at Art Center. So um, for everybody here, we have 15 minutes left. So I have one follow-up question for Charlie that um, you know that that will kind of conclude the pre-planned portion. We would love to answer your questions in any way, shape or form and really questions for Charlie are, are, are key. And uh, please put them into the Q&A and you can think about it over the next two minutes as we talk about the last question. Uh, and if you don't have any, any questions, we will continue on uh, discussing the, uh, you know, the, the, the follow-up. So um, I think the last thing, Charlie, I'd like to ask is knowing now what you know, what advice would you give to somebody, a student, an alum, somebody interested in, in the, sort of entering this space of creative entrepreneurship, what would you, what advice would you give them at this stage when they're just starting out uh, and hoping to, to follow a path like yours? Um, I think I'm very privileged because of my dance. What it showed me or what it taught me at a very young age is that it's absolutely possible to fall in love with what you do that pays you money to do the thing you're doing. And I think that's not, that's not something that everybody is so lucky to have. Um, and I knew that from the time I was 10 is that I had this thing that I love to do. So my first piece of advice is definitely to tell anybody that um, you, can, you can get paid doing something you love to do. Is, is that I'm on a mission to build that again. And I think it's important that everybody know that they could love their work. Um, I think that 
dance builds my pain threshold. <laughs> I have a really high pain tolerance. Um, in what, an 18 month window, I had a hip replacement, a hip reconstruction, three hip revisions. I tore all my adductors, I fractured my femur and I broke the joint, the fake joint that they put in, in this 18 month window. Um, so yeah, I think dancers have an incredibly high pain threshold and the value of that pain threshold is just persistence. Like more than I think sometimes people confuse it or they, they ask, you know, in an outcome, how much of this has to do with luck and how much of this has to do with skill. And I would say that uh, it really has to do like, not, like you don't start there. You have to go one step further because luck and skill can only happen with time and time is begot from persistence is that you just like perseverance. You have to stay in it long enough for those things to transpire. And I think a high pain threshold is, is the way to go about staying in it long enough. Nobody else is gonna make these things happen as hard as it gets. You stick it out as much as you can and eventually you'll find a way through. Um, right, and, and, and that is such an important piece for one of the unique things that Art Center offers the world is that we have resources for alumni like yourself to continue to get support and access to our network and our partners so that you don't just leave and never see us again, but in fact, are part of this much longer trajectory of professional development and education. Uh, and I think that that is really, really valuable and something that we, we want to provide more of. Um, like so a life raft. So instead of floating alone at sea, waiting for a boat to come, I have this nice little orange raft <laughs> that's kind of keeping me there waiting for the boat. I still need, I still need the boat to come sometimes. And other times you're like, I'm just going to have to paddle. And so you do it, or it's a combination of the two, but it's, it's very nice to have, um, a little orange ring sitting around my waist. Well, and it will always be there. So, um, we have a few questions, at, from, uh, from the audience, thank you. So Cheryl asks, how long does it take to make one house? It's a really great question. Um, so currently all of the houses, the actual production starts, I just, this is breaking news, hot off the press, um, is starting this week, uh, which is very exciting. And it should take, in theory, they say 10 days, but you kind of double that because you never know. Once they arrive uh, here at my house, um, I think that it takes about 23 minutes to make one, to assemble one, but I've not actually done it yet because I don't have the actual things here with me. So we're going to learn that. And I think if there are opportunities to condense that time, of course, you're always looking for what we call efficiencies uh, to figure out how to do this or in what sequence to do it. So there's as little static or disruption as possible. Yeah. So I'm going to become my own assembly line and we'll prototype that just like we've done everything else and figure out the most effective and efficient way to go about taking a whole bunch of flat pack houses, just like you get from Ikea and turning them into um, our camellia. Brilliant. So um, from a question from Ronnie here, how are you helping parents understand how to use this? Are you making a website or some way for parents to get feedback either in the moment or within a short period of time? Yeah, so I think um, for each of the rooms, I've made these little postcards that will come inside the room. And on the front, you'll see there's like the image of it unfolded with some call outs for directions on how the hinges work. Now, this is a little bit risky, I won't lie, because I'm trying not to provide direct directions. And a lot of that is because I don't feel like I can say, here's an open ended toy, play with it exactly like this. Like that doesn't, <laughs> it's a little contradictory. So here's a toy, play with it. Here's how the hinges work. And here's one way to set it up. And then the rest is kind of whatever you'd like to do with it or however it works for your make-believe. Um, on the back side of these cards are a series of prompts. So on one side, this here says, find all the hidden items. So it's a whole hide and seek game. There's a crack the code on the airplane um, here. I won't tell you where the code is, but I'll let you know that there underneath the bottom of that green luggage tag for France is a code. If you can crack that code, it delivers a message. And so that message would then be part of whatever is the game or the play it teaches about code breaking or code cracking. Um, so those are some of the activities that would become on this postcard. And then the rest of it is directed to the tutorium, which is an online portal, www.archimelia.com slash tutorium. 
And there you'll find hundreds of additional activities and prompts for parents to engage with with their kids or to, for kids to kind of do with uh, on their own. Great, great. And uh, an, another question here from Sequoia. Hi, Sequoia. Um, Sequoia asks, can kids design some of the rooms for the product? So are, are, are you able to incorporate the visual graphics or, or uh, ideas that some of your, um, your kids that are playing with the toy might have into the design? Mm -hmm. um, so right now on the tutorium are a whole bunch of prompts as we're talking about. So Sequoia, it's like, um, there's no reason why if you set up the airplane or hear about this, we'll take these out. This one, those are the postcards. So this is the house. And on the back of the house here is a broken window and the curtain is blowing around the corner of the window. And here's a chimney and a little fence with some grass. And there's a sheet blowing in the wind. But if you unfold this little lever, you could pop this up and flip it over. And now suddenly that curtain becomes the waves of the ocean. The chimney becomes a cannon. The ladder is now transformed from the earlier fence and the grass becomes seaweed. So you have this boat rocking through. Now what I've proposed in the tutorial, and you could do whatever you want, but here's one idea, is you get like a blue comforter or a towel and you lay it out on your bed and then your ship is sailing through the ocean of your bed. There's no sail though, right? The sheet is acting as a little bit of a sail right here blowing in the wind. But what if you instead found like a pencil and some construction paper and you made your own sail and attached it to the inside of this house with some tape, you could build out a pirate ship, you could build out a little dinghy that sits on the back. There's in fact even little directions on the inside of this roof right up here are some origami directions to make a little dinghy. And you could then set that with a little string and attach it or tie it to the back of your house or your boat. And as you sail through and get away from some sort of pirate adventure, you have your uh, backup dinghy, right? So a lot of it is, is construction play that you could add to it. When it comes to illustrations, I don't see why you can't do exactly as I did, which is just like draw a bird, cut it out, and then you could tape it to the inside surface. The surface of the paper is enough that a, like a low adhesive tape is gonna be just fine and peel off without marring it. So you could add your own artwork to the artwork of the house itself. Um, but then to directly answer this in the future, there definitely will be an opportunity to leave, um, you know, uh, like images where an app, you could upload a photograph and then turn that into a picture that you could with a static cling sticker put on it. And then lastly, Where's this one? In thinking of you, Sequoia, here in this room, do this, is the drawer. And on the back are all of these black and white line drawings for you to color in. So you could definitely enhance the artwork that exists, if not just adding to it. Great, great. And, and then our, our final question here, and then I'll have one more or maybe two uh, if the audience doesn't have any uh, additionals. So the, the, the last from the audience right now is um, from Ken, what mental roadblocks did you have to overcome in working with your, your audience? Have you done test marketing? Were children involved in the early stages of the creative process? Yeah. It's really okay. three, three questions, but, but combined together into really, how have you worked with children and tested the ideas and wrapped your head around all of that? Yeah, it's Ken, it's a great question. And there is a bit of a hurdle. I believe in um, anti-fragility, this notion that something that's fragile breaks with stress. With anti-fragility, something that has that is being gently stressed actually increases in strength. Your immune system, your musculature, your bone density, social empathy, all of these things require little constant stresses for us to be um, to become stronger. In that sense, learning, I think, is an anti-fragile event or activity, that a little bit of friction is a good thing. That's definitely not something that we're programmed for because technology is making everything so easy and thoughtless that I don't actually have to engage as a person. So there is a battle. A lot of this is messaging or talking to people. And I think early adopters understand that it's okay to be frustrated. When I've played with kids, so kids were part of the play testing and the researching all the way up through. Every prototype I made, I would go meet with another family um, and ask them just to play with it to see what they did. So kids and parents focus groups have definitely been involved in the creation from the beginning. Um, they, 
what I learned is that a kid will start to like, they'll see it and they'll think this is really cool and beautiful, but they'll be a little bit uh, trepidatious. And I'll invite them, no, you're allowed, like fold it, do something with this. And they start to, and then you see them suddenly transform where they realize that it is possible and they can do it. They set it up and then they suddenly want more. So it's that little bit in the beginning. And I don't yet know if it's my responsibility as a business owner and a creator to assist you over that hurdle. I'm inclined to say no, because it's literally the one thing that I would like kids to learn is that with a little bit more effort, they can get the jar open. With a little bit more effort, they can move the door. They can, with a little bit more, this world of possibilities on the other side waiting. Um, and I think that's also what this limited edition launch is about, is collecting that feedback from people that are beyond my community. It's very hard to test with kids because of um, ethics. You have to go through a very long series of steps and protocols. And back in the beginning when this started, I was just a student and didn't really have the jurisdiction to do this ethically. So a lot of the kids were within my family networks, people that I knew, friends who had kids. And that's great, but there's always this question of, are you giving me positive feedback because you're being nice to me as a friend? And so a lot of this next step, this limited edition launch is to get the really great critical and honest feedback that is gonna help us pivot and necessarily in order to get where we could go with this idea. Great. And, and then we have two wrap up questions here. Thank you, Sarah and Ozzy. So from Sarah, uh, she says, I love this toy so much, and I'm wondering how I can share it with others. Are there still some available to purchase from this first run? Yes, uh, you, so you can go to www.archamelia.com, and I sent it in the chat link, um, and that's where there are, and there are about 150 left in this limited edition collectible series launch. It comes with a book and the holiday package, so it has a free book and some free ground shipping, and um, with it, once you purchase, we'll be following up to get your feedback. So you could help us uh, pivot and design a better thing. Um, so yeah, please visit the website. You could also follow us on Instagram at Archimelia. Um, and we're also on Facebook. And both of those are linked on the website at the bottom. Great, thank you. And, and then finally, to, to wrap up here, and, and this is a great one to, to leave everybody with, Ozzy asks, Hi, Charlie, great product. How does the dollhouse teach children about sustainability as they play? Ooh, sustainability. You know, I don't think it overtly teaches about sustainability. I think it teaches about mechanics and engineering. So there's a lot of STEM and STEAM stuff in there. Um, but you know what's so amazing about that question is that I have assumed, I guess my, my approach to all of this was to say that sustainability should be um, integrated in the background, like it's just a way of life. It's not something that you're supposed to call out and get special attention for. It's just how we're supposed to live is responsibly and thoughtfully. Um, there are small indicators when possible. So in the kitchen, there are recycling bins. There's a solar garden roof, so we can have our own rooftop garden with some solar panels. So there are some illustrative elements that speak to sustainable practices. But this makes me think that I need to include on the website um, activities that directly call out what is sustainability um, as it goes towards educating youth. So it's a really great proposal. Great, great. Well, thank you. And that takes us right through to one o'clock. So uh, first and foremost, Charlie, so appreciative of your time today and sharing this. Uh, we, we had I've just learned so much and I continue to be so inspired by your work and your leadership in the space. And uh, you're, you're setting an amazing example for so many future creative entrepreneurs. So thank you for that. Thank you to everybody that attended at, you know, I know there's so many of these things these days. We also have to thank Innovate Pasadena and the Connect Week programming. They generously offered to host this uh, and, and share with their network as well. Um, and so we, we're very pleased to, to have their support. And, and then lastly, uh, Art Center is an open door. So please, for anybody that's interested uh, in any of this, contact me, contact Charlie, contact anybody at Art Center, and we will make sure that you are um, included in our community and part of the next wave of this type of design philosophy and amazing creative work. So. Uh, thank you. 
Charlie, thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Great Rob. to see everybody. And um, I'll, I'll leave everybody with my email in the chat if they need it. And we will see you next time. Bye for now. Bye, Charlie.